what I have to share. We can move on to the next person. Good evening. Thank you, Tom. Um, Thank you. Before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to remind everyone um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and we will get to them uh, right at the end when we take questions. And if you're on the phone, you can use the raise hand feature, which is star nine to um, note that you have a question and we will um, get uh, ask you during the question portion as well. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Mary Finley Brook, who will give us an overview of the Header Injustice Project. Good evening, it's an honor to be here. So I wanna start with precursors to the Header Injustice Project, and I'm gonna discuss corporate influences and regulatory failures getting us to where we are today. Next slide. Many of you recall the controversies over the expansion of the Skiffs Creek high voltage lines crossing the James River. There was much early opposition to this project. Interestingly, after impact statements were rushed through, and I will talk about court decisions tied to this regulatory failure, and after millions of dollars of mitigation funds were released, much of this opposition died. For example, tribes, including the Chickahominy, had gone on the record with various concerns, but have since fallen in line with subsequent expansion following multi-million dollar payments. It should be mentioned that these negotiations with native populations happened during federal recognition processes, which did not allow for free, prior, or informed consent. Next slide. This history is particularly important for the header project because Skiff's Creek line made it possible for the expansion of the Dominion Energy substation in Charles City that followed that allowed the siting of the gas plants that we're talking about today. It started this whole process leading to the header project. Next slide. For those of you who know this history, the Skiffs Creek project ended up in the courts. It was found that the Army Corps of Engineers had not completed the necessary environmental and social impact assessments, but the lines are already built and energized. The cooptation of land trusts and other groups as I mentioned, with the mitigation funds cannot be reversed. So impact assessments now are likely to be less accurate. Many of us know that there was a similar story with the $58 million in mitigation funds from Dominion Energy's Atlantic Coast Pipeline. As multi-million dollar payments often do, this money appeared to bias and or silence many in the state government and individuals or groups in the conservation community with direct and indirect benefit. I, for one, am getting tired of this pattern. It's all part of what we often disparagingly call the Virginia way, corporations controlling our so-called democratic institutions. Next slide. So much co-optation, pro-corporation bias and regulatory failure has gotten us to where we are today with our state crisscrossed by fracked gas build out and potentially much more on the way uh, even though these corporations are having a very difficult time, as we will hear, an increasingly hard time demonstrating need. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank the organization Pipeline Impacts, and particularly Stephen Metz at the New School for GIS Analysis and the maps I utilize in these slides. Now, the reason why Transco, and we've heard this referred to already, Williams Transcontinental, which in Virginia is made up of a group of parallel pipelines, of course, extends beyond us um, from Texas to New York. So Transco is not on this slide because the public frequently does not have access to locational data. It takes painstaking work to geolocate and map data that should be readily available because, as you just heard, these infrastructure projects uh, impact many lives deeply and frankly in very scary ways. Next slide. Many of us know, for example, of the Appomattox explosion on the Transco. This was felt all the way in Union Hill in Buckingham County and was one of the motivations behind the five-year battle to stop the compressor station. The main reason, of course, as we've already heard, was environmental racism and disproportionate harm to an historic African-American community. This is a pattern, of course, repeated in this header injustice project. Next slide. But industry is often able to hide or mask by making it very difficult to obtain basic information, including where their gas is coming from or going to, at what prices and in what amounts. Next slide. 
In case you think I'm exaggerating, please look at Virginia Natural Gas filings on their dockets with the State Corporation Commission. You're going to find out later how to, how to do this. I'm only providing two examples here of many dozen. Next slide. Before I discuss specific project sites, and I'm going to focus on the two with the most blatant environmental racism, I want to make clear one thing we have not been talking about enough in the SAVE Coalition. Virginia Natural Gas is the subsidiary of one of the largest and most aggressive utility companies in the U.S. called Southern Company. Southern Company is also Georgia Power and many other firms. By using state and locality specific names, giant corporations are able to mask their status as exploitative outsiders and make it seem like these projects are coming from the vicinity or were proposed to benefit the locality or the state. Don't be fooled. Virginia Natural Gas aims to help outside corporations connect to a series, series of interstate pipelines, and many of us suspect this could set the stage for exports. Next slide. The way that gas build out occurs, the public is kept in the dark through a, a regulatory process called segmentation. We've heard a couple of people already talking about this. Some of it's shown here with past projects connecting to what is now the header project. Each little part goes through the permitting and approval process if that was all we needed to look at. By redacting information and keeping internal communications from watchdog organizations, unless we have a successful lawsuit to force transparency with the public, we seldom know true plans for expansion until it's too late to stop. Many of us are getting sick and tired of this dangerous and potentially fatal ploy. Next slide. Unfortunately, since these energy and utility companies have so much power and money compared to our local governments, this manipulation of the public is often done with the eager support of local governments who act almost blindly when seeking tax revenue. Next slide. Even though I've followed these processes in many places, my detailed documentation of the governance of these gas plants, including the role of Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ, whose regulatory fiascos in Charles City over the past 14 months and continuing still absolutely astonish me. But when you have actors like Dominion Energy and Southern Company shelling out large quantities in consultancy fees, media campaigns, and remediation funds, the Virginia way allows for the subjugation of the rights of communities of color and potentially creates deadly risks for low-income families. Next slide. As we've heard, pollution levels near C4GT and a proposed second gas plant called Chickahominy Power are around where there are already concerning levels of pollution from a toxic landfill, which does have recent notice of violation, and the Roxbury Industrial Corridor. Next slide. You see here the location of these facilities along with the two proposed gas plants. So C4GT is entirely permitted and Chickahominy Power has a water permitting, uh, permit pending probably this summer that's going to go in front of the Water Pollution Control Board because this has been a very controversial process. Next slide. Charles City is a majority minority county with a large African American and Native population, up to 60 to 70 percent people of color in, the, in some areas of the three mile radius closest to the plants. As we Two minutes. In the process of these, um, in the proximity of these plants, we're concerned about harm to local health. We've heard a lot about this, so I'm going to go to my next slide where I'm going to end at the Gidley Compressor Station in Chesapeake. This is also, of course, as we've heard, near the terminus of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Next slide. And I'm honestly shocked that Virginia Natural Gas is proposing an expansion here because of the high levels of legacy pollutants, as well as the number of other toxic facilities in the vicinity. This is environmental racism. In the three mile radius around Gidley, residents are 55% people of color, 31% low income. Any new pollution will have potentially devastating consequences for this vulnerable population. Next slide. With preliminary analysis of the census tracts in a one mile radius around Gidley compressor using EPA's EJ screen, thanks again to Stephen Metz and pipeline impacts, you can see traffic exposure, Superfund sites, and risk management plan facilities, as well as hazardous waste percentiles are very high in comparison to other parts of Virginia please return for the second Save Coalition town hall later tonight, specifically focused on Hampton Roads. 
Next slide. Keeping in mind what I said earlier about needing to be aware of cloaked or hidden corporate pipeline expansion plans, I will end here reminding people of other proposed gas plants and the shocking truth that pipelines to supply those may not already exist. As these plants develop, we may be facing even more fracked gas build out in a time of cri climate crisis and with corporations directly targeting heavenly burdened and vulnerable populations. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Mary. And now we'll have Tom, Tom Hadwin who will tell us about the need for this project. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? As you can see, I've put the dollars here because as many new pipelines are these days, they're more about the profit opportunity than they are about meeting a specific public need. Uh, next one. But to be clear, uh, Virginia Natural Gas has a legal obligation to meet requests for service. And that's what C4GT did. They're fully permitted by DEQ and they made a request for service and that began the pipeline design process. But I think what we need to focus on is are these requests legitimate? First of all, these are uh, privately owned power plants. They don't have any direct benefit to Virginians. And because of the economic setbacks and other factors, getting access to money, they've even asked to delay the project. Although Virginia Natural Gas came back with a motion to actually speed it back up. Next. Their marketplace for their energy is a not-for-profit organization called PJM. They're in charge of all the electrical generation and interstate transmission in the shaded area that you see that are in parts of 13 states. Next. The PJM has been granted the right by the State Corporation Commission to use its forecast for Dominion, for example, rather than Dominion's over-exaggerated uh, demand increases. So you can see that that forecast for the next decade, actually more than that, is flat. Next. So what has happened in the past when we've had economic downturns, this is the one in 2008, 2009, you see that electricity use fell even faster than the decline in economic activity. And as the economy picked back up, our energy use did not to the same degree. In fact, in the last 10 years since this time, even though our economy has picked up, our populations continued to grow, our electrical use in this region has remained flat. Next. So the blue bars show the excess of generating capacity in PJM. The zero you see is meeting the peak demand at the time. And the red bar corresponds to what they need to hold in reserve in case the unit goes down unexpectedly or the weather is more extreme. So all they need to have reliable operation is the blue bar going to the red line. Anything to the right of that is excess capacity, unneeded generation that somebody's having to pay for. And in 2023, this is when C4GP would begin operation and just a few years later, you can see how much that surplus has grown. Next, please. So in addition to selling into an already saturated market, the COVID-19 caused economic uh, setback is really causing a strain on the availability of capital. Lots of businesses, lots of unemployed people are going to be looking for cash. That's going to make it harder for these private uh, generators to fund their project. Next. In addition to that, Virginia passed a law this year that is requiring power plants to pay for the amount of carbon they emit in the form of carbon dioxide. And th over the next 10 years, the statewide cap will decline by 3% each year. 
Next. And that cap will have to be shared by presently 33 power plants. So each one will have to be purchasing an allowance for each ton of, of carbon it emits. Next one, please. And this will be done in an auction. So the, the blue bar you see on the left is the statewide cap in 2030 that should be shared by 23 power plants around the state. If C4GT gets built, that's just one more plant, but it will take up over one fifth of the cap. Next one, please. If the even larger Chickahominy plant is built, those two together will occupy more than half of the statewide limit for all of our carbon emitting power plants. That means these allowances will get more and more expensive. The ratepayers of the utilities who own the other plant will pass those costs along to its customers. So by these two plants uh, operating for a private profit will cost the rest of us a great deal more money. Next one. So it's coming right out of our pocket, out of the, uh, the utility bills of our businesses and our families. Next. Now, C4GT and Chickahominy are organized as limited liability companies. That means the investors are limited in their liability only to the extent of their investment. And their investment's going to build the power plant and to operate it not to guarantee their full lifetime payment back to the pipeline. Well, they shut down early as they have in other states, three years in Texas, eight years in California. And actually the new Clean Energy Act in Virginia requires them to be closed by 2050. So they would operate at maximum 27 years. And Virginia Natural Gas is expecting this pipeline to be written off over 70 years. So any shortfall has to be picked up by someone else. Next. So who pays them? Well, it could be the other shippers like Dominion and Columbia Gas, but then those higher costs would be passed on to their customers. It could be VNG. Perhaps they would pass that on to their ratepayers if they could, but uh, the FCC is now sensitive to that and trying to put some barriers to that. But now we've crippled an important gas uh, company because they can't get money back to pay for what they've invested in the pipeline. And these people asking for service, it doesn't really cost them anything. There's no risk. Next. So not only isn't the need of these private generators uh, legitimate, but both Dominion and Columbia Gas are all also asking for more service without really needing it. In fact, they're saying we need it for diversity of service. They don't even claim that they need it to have adequate service. Uh, Dominion is already served by three or four different pipelines. They really don't need another one, especially since they announced two weeks ago that they're not building any more gas plants. And in last year's fuel factor proceeding, the SEC made a ruling that says they have adequate capacity in existing pipelines to meet the needs of all their current power plants. So my recommendation in comments was for the SEC to rule on whether these are good requests or not before ruling on the need to build a new pipeline. Next one, please. And that, along with a general request to postpone the hearings, one, for a reason many of you already commented on, it's really difficult for the public to participate right now. The second one is these issues about is C4GT really going to get built? Is Dominion's request legitimate? Is Columbia Gas's need legitimate? Remember, Dominion has a $6 million contract six excuse me six billion dollars that they owe the acp over 20 years for a huge amount of gas for a huge amount of pipeline capacity that they won't need because they won't have any new power plants virginia natural gas has a similar commitment for three billion dollars 
these companies have already put themselves or potentially their ratepayers on the hook for gas service, and now they're asking for more. So my recommendation to the SEC and others may want to make it too is take your time. Wait until the need is certain before issuing an order to construct something that may not get fully paid for 